Hello, my name is Ann Gordon. I'm a retired professor from Rutgers University and historian. And this talk is called Thinking Ahead to History, Finding Traces of Women's Activism. This is a talk about historical evidence and historical sources. During the long centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment, there was plenty of talk about history. And there was often confusion between history as people and events back in the past and people in the, and history as a modern telling of the past by historians. We use the word in multiple ways. They weren't often talking about that space in between the past and modern telling. The transmission of evidence forward to younger activists, if it's a long movement like the suffrage movement and future students of history. And if they did speak of transmission, of how activists made certain that we had evidence enough to learn about their work, their efforts were described as kind of suspicious, a case of cynically managing their brand. Their efforts among, these efforts among 19th century activists are my subject here. I am aware that to suggest we think ahead to history sounds paradoxical. History's behind us, isn't it? Um, back there. But in any given moment, if you don't think ahead and leave evidence, then you make it impossible for people in the future to look back in time and learn about our experiences. Women who wanted equal rights believed in the importance of their work and tended to document it. After all, did anyone think the white males running the country were gonna write histories of these agitators? They saved and protected their stuff, evidence about their work. And as a result of their foresight, we were able to look back at their history. I come to this topic of historical sources after 30 years at work on locating and eventually publishing the papers of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Their work required, among other things, that we comprehend not just the trail they consciously left behind, but the ways evidence of their work appeared in places, odd places, like the minutes of a women's club in the Midwest or a local newspaper in, the, in a Rocky Mountain town. When we stopped our search, we had found their papers in 200 libraries and agencies like the National Archives, as well as in an attic or two. Their words were found in nearly 700 different newspapers and journals. We mapped their daily lives, uncovered their activities, imagined what evidence they covered, they created each day, and plotted how to find that evidence if it survived. A diary entry might mention a letter. A letter names a petition to Congress. A scrapbook clipping announces a, common, a coming speech. One embarks on a treasure hunt with clues like that to produce a comprehensive collection of papers. One also learns a lot about the history of women thinking ahead to history. They wanted us to be able to find things. But acting, asking activists to act like archivists is not always a workable plan. With the time and energy they devote to preserving the past, they could be changing the present. Elizabeth Cady Stanton in her 70s felt that pull between past and present. By that time in her life, she was writing articles for publication as her chief mode of activism. She had become in a sense what we now call a talking head, a woman with a lot of opinions. On one occasion, she was writing her memoir in installments for a friend's weekly newspaper. But she wrote that friend in August, 1890 with a complaint. I am awfully sick of these reminiscences. You insist on my giving an account of myself for the, for the 20 remaining years and running on until next April in your paper? Or do you say, hold enough? There is so much in the living present to write about. There is so much in the living present to write about. There's that tension in a nutshell. When a similar moment hit Susan B. Anthony in late 1880, she would have been 60 years old, she was stuck at Stanton's house in Tenafly, New Jersey, plodding along on to produce a volume, the first volume of the history of women's suffrage. 
When she complained to a young friend, you can almost feel her restlessness. Nobody knows a thing for certain, only a glimmering recollection of something. And I'm just sick to death of the whole of it. I had rather wash or whitewash or any possible hard work than sit here and go through digging into the dusty records of the past. That is rather make history than write it. Rather make history than write it. There's that tension again. Despite the opposing demands on activists' time and energy, the reform movement for women's equal rights is quite well documented. That is not to say that it is evenly documented. A racially segregated society, for example, was no better at treating historical evidence with equal respect than it was at treating women of color equally with white women. And race is not the only circumstance that affected whether written records of activism were created, were saved, and are made known to students of history. Were the lectures and letters of immigrants who were active in the suffrage movement, but who were speaking their native tongue, recognized as important and preserved? Who made sure when voting rights were won that the minute book of a small local suffrage society was donated to a library? Who took the time to find a home for the papers of, of women in small towns who made the suffrage movement a national campaign with local roots across the land? The stuff of history is not perfectly distributed, preserved, or accessible. And that reality does affect the history we can re recover, the breadth of our peering into the past, and the complexity we will discover there. Despite their complaints about being pulled away from their work as reformers, Stan and Anthony did continue to think ahead to history. Stanton wrote those next installments of her memoirs and later put them together in a book, 80 Years and More. Working with Matilda Jocelyn Gage, they finished three volumes of that history of women's suffrage, a valuable compendium of agitation at every level of government through 1885. In that work, they preserved for us the names of thousands of activists and glimpses of agitation and organization in all the states and territories. The prize for thinking ahead goes to Anthony. She put enormous effort into distributing evidence about the 19th century movement into libraries and encouraging her collaborators to put their historical evidence in order. She began to clear her attic of stuff. She corresponded with librarians about what they might want of the pamphlets and suffrage newspapers she found there. It turned out that she had, for example, multiple runs of the newspaper, The Revolution, that she published after the Civil War. She didn't need, no one library needed multiple sets. So they were distributed to libraries across the country. When she discovered that Syracuse University lacked a copy of another suffrage newspaper, National Citizen and Ballot Box, edited by the late Matilda Jocelyn Gage, she put the university librarian in touch with one of Gage's daughters who had extra sets at her house and she was looking for a place to deposit them. The biggest of her gifts, Anthony's gifts, went to the Library of Congress. Hundreds of books were sent from her family's collection, some of them quite old and quite rare. They weren't just her personal um, accumulation. Um, runs of newspapers went from anti-slavery days as well as women's rights work. Pamphlets published for women's suffrage campaigns and scrapbooks galore. This was not a gift simply to celebrate herself. 20 years ago, when I acquired a reprint of the rare 1893 uh, booklet by Ida B. Wells and others called The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exposition, um, I was delighted to see that the copy used for this 20th century reprint was the copy Susan B. Anthony had given to the Library of Congress in 1903. There was a connection. She had looked ahead and somebody made use of what she'd done. About Anthony's donations to the Library of Congress, I'll limit myself today um, to her scrapbooks, more than 40 volumes of them. 
she started to collect printed material for scrapbooks at the suggestion of her father. In the winter of 1853 and 54, during one of her early tours as an organizer in New York State, he asked her, we're told, would it not be wise to preserve the many and amusing observations by the different newspapers that years hence, in your more solitary moments, you and maybe your children can look over the views of both the friends and opponents of the cause, the eternal hope of that parent, that he will become a grandparent. There was an element of the autobiographical about the start of SBA's dive into scrapbooking, but her father's advice was aimed at public responses to this new reform movement. Listen to what they're saying, that's gonna amuse you later. And he pointed her toward newspapers. Suffrage's scrapbooks are stuffed with newspaper clippings. And while using Anthony's scrapbook to track down things like newspaper reports of a speech she gave through the Midwest, we would discover instances where no copies of a local newspaper had survived. And the fact that Anthony cut that clipping out and put it in a scrapbook was the only evidence remaining of events in that town. The scrapbooks are rich with evidence about the world around her too, especially injustices, inequalities, and agitators, as well as tracking how newspapers reported her own speeches. The use of scrapbooks to document the world they are fighting to change seems to be, a, seems to be characteristic of scrapbooking suffragists. Matilda Jocelyn Gage kept track of her political work as reported in newspapers, but many pages of her scrapbooks resemble somebody in someone's research files, a place to keep articles that might prove useful when drafting a speech or writing an article or just making an argument. The parts of Elizabeth Smith Miller's, another upstate New York person, Elizabeth Smith Miller's scrapbooks at the Library of Congress that I've consulted Take note of big picture topics in the suffrage movement. She understands the national story, but it's her attention to local details in Geneva, New York, and her attention to local, to state politics of women's suffrage that makes her scrapbooks especially valuable. She will have multiple clippings from multiple newspapers of the same event. She's that thorough, and you can't duplicate that as an independent researcher starting from zero. The tendency to think of scrapbooks as personal records, a collection of cherished mementos like mine was when I was a child, is a disservice to researchers. These scrapbooks are loaded with the evidence of history. When Susan B's scrapbooks reached the Library of Congress, the most distinguished librarian, librarian in the country at the time, Ainsworth Spofford, spent time looking through them and he was impressed. He had retired as Librarian of Congress, but was acting librarian in the summer of 1903 and corresponded with Anthony about her donations. He wrote to her on July 22nd to answer questions she'd asked. And then, and I quote, permit me to add that after some examination, I regard the series of over 40 volumes of scrapbooks containing full reports of the National Suffrage Conventions, besides a multitude of speeches on the subject decisions of the courts, reports of congressional committees, et cetera, as an invaluable addition to the Library of the United States. Spofford saw a documentary record of a vibrant reform movement, the public face of a movement Anthony had, was helping, had helped to build. I think she was touched by his recognition of her work in looking ahead to history. She replied very quickly and note that she is looking ahead to history. In this passage, she is imagining us coming back to use that um, scrapbook. <clears throat> Here's what she wrote to Spofford. I am very glad if you think my scrapbooks amount to very much. They are a heterogeneous mass. Everything is put in as nearly as possible in chronological order. And that makes a wonderful mixing up of the subjects. If I could have commanded time, patience, eyesight, et cetera, et cetera. I would have made an index to them. They are a perfect swamp of things, which if indexed would be of a great deal of value. 
I wonder if you cannot set some of your boys or girls when they have nothing else to do about the indexing work. Stop and think for a second about the trail here. We, we can tell these this story, scrapbooks, Bofford, Anthony. We can tell this story because the Congressional Library had systems for keeping letters and, and tracking donations. Like any modern office would, it kept mail received from Susan B. Anthony and file copies of letters marked to her. Within the archives, there's an archives of the archives. Um, the same letter to Spofford reveals another project. I am now making a scrapbook of all of Mrs. Stanton's speeches that I have. There will be three large books. I shall send them to your library together with the rest as soon as done. I am trying to get things cleared up, ready to go over. I'm a little younger, but I know what that phrase means. Her role in that particular set of scrapbooks, the Stanton speeches, is kind of, obs is kind of obscured because they are filed at the Library of Congress under Elizabeth Cady Stanton papers. But it's Anthony that got those all that information about Stanton's speeches there. Now we can turn to a different kind of evidence. In the Library of the Chicago Historical Society, there is a huge collection that allows us to tap into the work of building and sustaining a movement for equal rights from a very different angle. In the spring of 1880, the National Women Suffrage Association, led by Stanton, Anthony, and Matilda Gage, wanted to apply maximum pressure to the Republican Party when delegates gathered in, in Chicago for their national convention and wrote the party's platform. They rented an auditorium in Chicago, called for a, quote, mass meeting for all women who want to vote to be held during the convention and invited, and I quote again, every woman of the United States to attend. If a trip to Chicago was impossible, women were, quote, urged to send a letter or postal with her name and wish expressed in her briefest and strongest manner and address it to Elizabeth Cady Stanton in Chicago. In terms of changing the minds of Republican politicians, the campaign was a bust. In terms of mobilizing women to action, it was a stunning success. Women from 36 states and territories signed their names to messages expressing their desire to vote. There are more than 1600 responses in that collection, many bearing multiple names. At temporary headquarters in the Palmer House Hotel, the mail was organized by state and town in order that the activists could show convention delegates some hometown opinion. An alert librarian at the Chicago Historical Society, Albert Hager, noticed the National Association's plans and wrote to Stanton, would she please donate records of their meeting to the society? And he went on, we hope too that you will also do the society the great favor to deposit in its archives all the letters and postals which, may which you may receive in response to your invitation to attend that meeting. When Mr. Hager received the cards and letters in the fall of 1880, he was disappointed. It seems that he had imagined a valuable collection of autographs, letters signed by famous women. He complained to Gage, but he did hold on to the collection. It is precisely the quality that disappointed Mr. Hager that makes this collection valuable for us to look back at history. The famous names were the people able and willing to come to Chicago for that meeting. With the, mail, with the evidence mailed in, we can take our eyes off the big names and hear what other women brought to the fight for women's suffrage. The women who sent their cards were college students, factory workers, housewives, immigrants writing in their native tongue, women active in church groups, professional women, and postmistresses in town. I've selected a few examples, and if you'll bear with me, we will now try screen sharing so that you can see a couple of examples. 
the one I'm going to talk about is the one on the right, on the left. Sorry. Um, this is a postcard from Sarah Ely. Sarah Ely mailed her postcard from Philadelphia on June 1st, 1880. You can see here that um, you can see that uh, the address people were given. These are all addressed to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. That was the instructions in the announcement, and they were given a street address. I forget if I ever did look up what that's the address of. She doesn't live there. This is something that's arranged specifically for the meeting. <clears throat> so she mailed on June first. We can see with the post that the uh, done what you've got here is through the sides of two the same message. <clears throat> there were two Sarah Ely's in Philadelphia at the time of the 1880 census, both single, one in her 50s, one in her 70s, and I can't tell which of them. It wrote this card, but I will read it to you because it's pretty hard to read. <clears throat> I want to vote because I believe it be a duty of every person living in a so-called republic to choose lawmakers that will protect the purity of its institutions and provide for a just distribution of its benefits among its, citizens, its inhabitants. Sarah, in that little postcard, has a whole political philosophy. She defines her alienation, so-called republic, is direct and damning language. Then she be suggests better politicians are needed, and the implication is that she would use her vote to elect better ones. And she protests inequality, not only in political power, I, as I read it, but in that her society, greater equality is needed, a just distribution of society's benefits. Not all sentiments placed on these postcards can make us proud. Some women wanted the vote to put a stop to immigration, sound familiar? Other women resented that male slaves they once owned got to vote before they did. And there's the war against the demon rum, women who want to vote only to rid their towns of the liquor traffic. But there is, among the 600 items, a strong thread of appeals to fairness and to equal justice, as well as invocations of the American Revolution that it applied to women too. Listen to a postcard from a woman in Oregon, Missouri. I've had no luck learning about this woman, but I do know that both Susan B. and Mrs. Stanton had lectured in her hometown on separate occasions in the 1870s. Perhaps A.M. Bridges, as she identified herself, had heard them, but she does not parrot them. She has her own political language crafted from basic American history and her own situation. And I'm sorry, I don't have an image of this postcard. I want to vote. I am a widow and have to pay taxes and would like to have something to say about where the money goes to. Taxation without representation, and she does put that in quotations, is just as unjust now as it was a hundred years ago. What do we learn from these messages? All these women recognized the names of famous suffragists when the invitation appeared in dozens of subscription newspapers, spiritualist ones and so forth, and they took the request seriously enough to write one postcard, or in some cases, carry a message around their neighborhood, asking other women to sign on. Yet they also don't agree with each other. If you're going to organize these women into a political unit, what the suffragist leadership needed to do, organize them into a political unit, it will take work. And we know it did. We also hear in these messages, women expressing an awareness of inequality and hopes for change, even if they don't agree what equality and change might mean. I think as a mass, the public, the 1880 postcards tell us that there's a stirring afoot, or as we sang in the 1960s, there's something happening here, but what it is ain't exactly clear. One more example from this collection, this one from Richmond, Virginia. Lavinia Pryor, and I'm expanding her name, um, she signs Liv, L-I-V, um, wrote a letter on behalf of a new Ladies Enterprise Club made up of women of color. 
or to quote her final sentence, she wrote, quote, on behalf of your downtrodden colored sisters of Virginia. A large part of her letter is about the use of whipping as a legal punishment for women's small crimes and a lot of details of a recent horrific example that it partly, it, she implies, may have stirred up the organization of the Ladies' Enterprise Club. In their new club, it was their object, she wrote, to petition, lecture, and do all things which shall so soften the heart of mankind that they will see and must grant and respect our rights. She knows that the call went out for views about voting rights, but she, it seems to me, has a different goal. The call for letters offered her an opportunity to find allies. It was not every day that she had an address for Elizabeth Stanton. She concludes her letter by saying, we are your sisters though colored. Still we feel in our bosom and want of fraternal love from our white sisters of the country. In a postscript, she asks for help assembling a library to educate women in her club. And wouldn't we love to know what happened next? Did anyone answer that letter? I'm reasonably sure about identifying her as Lavinia Pryor. I was able to find her in the 1880 census, age 37, married to a carpenter. She's a shopkeeper. They have three children and both were born in Virginia, probably just by subtraction, probably born into slavery. We have in this evidence that we have, we have, it's full of gaps. We got things, many things that we never would have had, words that were never written down, arguments at meetings, for example, words burned up accidentally or on purpose, words that someone decided weren't important enough to preserve. The discovery of gaps in the stuff of history need not el elicit charges of malfeasance or self-aggrandizement without evidence of intent. We should always ask, why does this gap exist? One answer, personal circumstances vary a great deal. The idea that you would or could retain your mail was not universally accepted or always possible, even if you were doing important work by way of your letters. We are by and large talking about individuals, not organizations or institutions. There isn't the structure in place that I've mentioned about the Library of Congress. While surfing through her, sorting through her accumulated stuff in 1897 and trying to retrieve her own letters from friends, Susan B. Anthony complained. I wrote to Mrs. Stanton the other day that if she had only kept my letters since 1850 as religiously as I have kept all of hers, between us, we should have a complete history of all the suffrage work for the last 45 years. Alas, she continued, she has burned up every one as fast as received, not only mine, but everybody's else, so that I am left to infer what I wrote to her by what she answers me. Susan Anthony lived in a three-story house shared only with her sister, where the attic could be what attics can be, a place of storage. The house on Madison Street in Rochester, some of you probably visited, was her base of operations for 40 years, a rare stability of residence. When she complains about Mrs. Stanton's destruction of mail, she is talking about a woman who lives in a New York City apartment with two adult children. Moreover, Stanton had relocated many times no doubt purging her stuff each time as we all do. Another reason for gaps can be that families were not comfortable with unvarnished truth for some reason. Families faced with a parent's stuff act differently. Some of you may be in that position. Anthony returned letters to their authors or to family members if the authors had died that might work out well, as it seemed to with the letters of Martha Coffin Wright, an important early, early ally in the New York State agitation. Martha's children took good care of their mother's papers. Stanton's children, not so much. 
we, there is a trail of misbehavior. There are manuscript letters with big X's over them where they're telling, instructing a typist to not type this part of the letter. There are piles of signatures cut off the bottom of letters that no longer exist. There are, so you had auto, people started demanding autographs of Stanton, you had a supply. There are then type transcripts. Sometimes you can nowadays prove are two, are two letters put together, the parts they liked put into one as though it all happened at the same time. And then they published a butchered edition of their mother's letters in 1922. This kind of thing can happen. Now they were more active. Some people just go to the, you know, black plastic trash bags. Um, they put a lot of effort into their um, destruction. But most loss of historical evidence was not planned and plotted. Destruction happens, and it happens when it happens. Considering consider just one fire in upstate New York and there are plenty of fires in upstate New York that did this, that altered the evidence about early agitation for women's rights in the region. In early morning hours of March 29, 1911, fire broke out in the New York State Capitol, starting in the chamber of the assembly and spreading to the state library, at that time housed in the same building. Between fire and water, and here you see the fire, if you're a librarian, you might want to you know, cover your eyes right now. Between fire and water, the damage to the library and state archives were devastating. The official count of losses that I was able to find, books, 450,000. And manuscripts, 270,000 lost to that fire. Among the manuscripts were petitions to the state legislature. It was the library and archives. And among the petitions were ones like this rescued one circulated in New York. I'll help you with the text. You're just seeing the shape. Um, like this rescued one circulated in New York in 1855 and submitted to the legislature early in 1856. We know what the printed text says. We can't even see it on this damaged one. We know what the printed text says because the text of this position, petition had been published in newspapers. It read in part, whereas the women of the state of New York are recognized as citizens by its constitution and yet are disfranchised on account of sex only, we do respectfully demand for them the right of suffrage, a right which involves all other rights of citizenship and one which cannot justly be withheld. This item is preserved protected from further damage and decay, but none in this condition, and there are others, can be restored to offer us the most valuable information, the names of the men and women willing to put pen to paper for the cause in 1855. We would know a lot about the effectiveness of activists organizing and the appeal of equal rights if we could use such petitions to learn about supporters. We can recover a few names here. One of the things that this, what I think is supposed to be happening here is that it's a, a column for women to sign and a column for men to sign. That leaves the question up here with John C. Uh, Warden just above the indent. Um, that maybe that woman, if a, this is the woman's side, she may have, signed it as Mrs. John C. Warden. Um, it doesn't, it does definitely does not work that a husband and wife signed opposite each other. That you can tell that even in the damage. Um, you know, the first letters of the names over here don't match the ones on this side. But it would have been a terrific sort, and they were they were sorted and kept track of by um, by, the, by the towns and, and districts, assembly districts that they came from. So we could have done geographical work on who is it? Where's this petition being circulated most efficiently and, and heavily? And who are these people that are signing it? Um, are these the wealthiest people in town? Are these the non-wealthiest people in town? We'd have learned a lot if that evidence um, had happened. But perhaps 
the most consequential impact on the survival of evidence of activism is public and private attitudes toward that history. If no one thinks the history of women struggling to gain equal civil and political rights is important, what's going to happen? Three stories, if I may use my personal experience, since I have now lived through the revival of women's history in the, in the 20th last quarter of the 20th century. I was a history major at a women's college in the early 1960s, and I learned nothing about unequal rights of women in the US or in Britain. In retrospect, there was a message in that silence about who and what mattered. Well, in graduate school, by the time I got to graduate, there was nothing like women's history being taught. We didn't even have women in the history department when I got to graduate school in, in the teaching level. We were, they didn't mind having our tuition, but they wouldn't hire a faculty member. Well, in graduate school, where I began to work with other women to figure out what women's history might look like, we would walk into used bookstores and find volumes of that history of women's suffrage, Stanton Anthony and Gage. We would find it on the shelves for sale priced not as rare and valuable books, but as cast-offs. They were often copies discarded by libraries. I discovered that one of the old copies at my house came out of the Brown University Library, then was bought by Eleanor Flexner and then found its way to my house. They are often copies discarded by libraries because no one showed any interest in those books and shelves were crowded. There was a disconnect there we're a group of young people out and about trying to learn some history of women, but too late to stop libraries from making that a harder job. But things were changing. The 70s saw a great deal of change to try to bring the importance of the history up to a higher level in public and um, academic and library circles. One example, a national survey of manuscript collections got underway in 18, 1974 to identify and describe what evidence about the lives of women lay hidden in manuscripts collect, collections that, are no, that no one bothered to describe and make accessible. These are, John, these are John Fremont's papers, The Great Explorer. Oh, but look how much Jesse, Jesse Fremont papers are in it. It was that kind of situation. The result of this national survey, two volumes published in 1979 with the title Women's History Sources. It not only guided students of history to hidden treasures and fueled the surge of new history writing from that point forward, but the results also changed how archivists viewed and described the manuscripts in their care. It had established a demand, a whole sea change had happened. And eventually, before I finished my PhD, they were starting to teach a little women's history in the history department. Evidence about women's lives mattered. That was getting established, perhaps reestablished, but it made a big difference in how easy it was to find things and to look back in history. And probably it protected some, some things that were coming into libraries, the looking ahead to history, that suddenly your records of some club, club devoted to making, getting equal pay for women faculty or something, suddenly the minutes of your club matter to, in, to some archives. The evidence for understanding the past is not showered down upon us. I hope you're taking that away. It results from human actions, creating that evidence, recognizing its value, ensuring its preservation, and making it accessible, something that people can find. I'm guessing that Sarah Ely of Philadelphia and A.M. Bridges of Missouri never thought of themselves as writing for the ages, never imagined that their pen tracks would be in a research library 140 years later. They wrote those postcards because someone else in their time period thought their words mattered. 
We don't have another way to hear a sampling of opinions across the country in 1880. By a simple act, they gave us that. So let me er end by urging you to look ahead to history in your turn. The stuff of history is made up of small bits, small acts left behind by every one of us on purpose or happenstance. For history to be written now and in the future, we need to look both behind and ahead. Thank you. <laughs>